So, but nevertheless, this uh, process is happening on the server. The server actually works up this data and send final data to you in a very small, uh, relatively small and nice presented form. Like uh, your ticket, if you fly from this day to this day, it will cost uh, this and this amount of dollars. Okay, very concise answer. But in order to come up with that answer, you have to actually do a lot of computation. Okay, and definitely the cases when the computation is, uh, I mean. Uh, is extensive, is common, very common. Okay, so uh, besides that, uh, the server is not organized the way that it immediately receives the request and then start working on the test. Uh, complex logic might be implemented on a server. First of all, server might implement queuing. Okay, so uh, any, anyone who is uh, uh, familiar with the Jenkins or Hudson? Yeah? Okay, you got it. So uh, this is actually also a very interesting topic, and I believe we have some time uh, to talk about that. So uh, what these systems are, these are a continuous build system. Okay, so uh, another, another application is called cruise control. Okay, so what happens is that uh, when you create a build, and uh, in the case if, you, uh, if your application is relatively small and it doesn't require an extended period of time to build it, like for example, we're talking about minutes, okay? Let us say we create a Java application and to build that Java application takes maybe say a couple of minutes, okay? Five minutes, okay? Now, and then you realize that developers are constantly making changes to this application during the day, maybe say 10 or 15 changes during the day. And then you like to make sure that nothing is broken, okay? So what we like to do is just like to arrange some test cases, which might be unit test cases, might be some basic UI test cases, depending on our, on our situation. Now, these systems, which I mentioned, they allow you to uh, immediately run these test cases immediately after you build this developer. So essentially, every time the developer makes a change in the code, then this build is started automatically. Okay? As soon as the build is started, at the end of the build, the creation process, we have uh, test cases around, okay? So it means that after uh, several <coughs> minutes time frame, you get the information, is this build is good enough? And the test cases are passing. And basically, if test cases are passing, that means the build is good enough. Now, if build is failing, then the developer has to fix it because that may affect a lot of other people, okay? So you have to be very uh, careful about that. So this, uh, the several systems are available, including custom but one of the systems is called Jenkins, okay? Or former Hudson. Uh, that, that name is Hudson. It's, uh, its original name is Hudson, but uh, for copyright, uh, pro they had copyright problems with some companies, so they had to change the name. Now it's called Jenkins. Okay. So uh, what happens is that uh, Jenkins is a very highly customizable piece of software. It's open source, so it means that it's free. So uh, you can create, uh, you can have a machine with the Jenkins installed, and this uh, Jenkins machine can build several builds at the same time. It's basically several applications at the same time. But uh, computer resources are limited. So, if, for example, if you have ten different builds here, uh, for example, one build might be for demonstration, right? Essentially, code is the same, but might with minor changes. Another build for few engineers. Another build for developers, another build for production, whatever. You may have, say, 10 or 15 different builds uh, uh, specified. It does not mean that uh, these builds will run at the same time simultaneously. Okay? You can actually highly customize them and say, you know what, this build will run every day at midnight. This build will run every time the developer make a change. This build will run at 6 p.m. or whatever. But it is also possible to schedule them to run at the same time as soon as the to make a change. You can do that. Okay? Now, when you have 10 builds uh, uh, specified to be run immediately, then it might be a concurrency problem, right? Because computer uh, CPU cannot handle 10 builds at a time. Okay? So what happens here, they have a queue, mechanism of queue. The reason that uh, your request for a build uh, is placed in a queue, in the line. So as soon as the resources are available, the next available build, which is on the, on the line, will be built and then released. The, to the reporting system, okay? So it means that uh, this, this is a server, and Jenkins is a server, typical, and then uh, it, it, it implemented this queuing mechanism. Essentially, if you, if you send several requests, which cannot be fulfilled at the same time, 
then you have to wait. The same thing happens, concurrency usually happens when you, when a popular rock group comes here, like uh, Pink Floyd or uh, Led Zeppelin will come, or I hope, someday. You'll see that it will be a problem to buy a ticket, okay? Because of the better, that Friday, which the ticket is going on sale, you'll have problems of buying. You may wait actually uh, 30 minutes until the web page will be updated, and then your confirmation will come, okay? This happens because a lot of people are actually uh, trying to do uh, one thing at the same time, I mean, uh, uh, purchasing tickets at the same time, and they create a concurrency. So a company cannot build up these servers so they can handle, say, millions of requests of the simultaneously because there is no point of doing that. This peak of activity has happened maybe a couple of times during a year, okay? So the justification of buying new hardware and software, I mean, it's not enough. And you cannot justify that saying, you know what, during a couple of days in the year, uh, we, we, for, for that reason, for a couple of days, we have to buy this very expensive hardware. No one will go on that. So it means that there will be a lot of dissatisfied people, but but that's part of the life, okay? That's another thing, is that uh, server may implement the screen mechanism just to handle the request one at a time, or several requests at a time. And typically are uh, very complex. Business logics are very complex, because uh, uh, say, uh, specifically, uh, uh, one example which comes to my mind is that uh, stock trade, okay? I have, I, have, I know people who are, you know, are daily, uh, 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 daily traders, they call daily, daily traders, and uh, selling and uh, buying stock is not so simple as it seems from outside. Okay, so the, uh, the logic behind that is very complex. They take a stock and say, you know what? If the stock price goes above, for example, they have this. Uh, they explain to me. Okay, <laughs> I'm still not good at that. But say, you know what? If the stock price goes in in this range, then you have to buy, say, for example, 70 percent of that. Okay. If it goes above this range, then the say 25 uh, five percent of the rest of you know, the amount I allocated to that. So the logic may be very complex, and then the price may go actually fluctuate, and then it might not be even uh, fast enough to, to do that. Okay. But essentially, what happens is that you can program your activity this way, and they can put these conditions on a server, and then whenever stock price goes within this range server will react accordingly, so you get your probably 70% of your sum of, I mean, stock of purchase, but not, you will not need the 75 and so on, okay? So it means that these applications which are located on the server might be very complex, okay? It's not simply like buy and sell, okay? So said that, and then uh, besides that, we uh, may delegate the server activities on another hardware machine. So essentially it means that we may have several machines running, uh, running this request. Typical good example is uh, Google, okay? When you type your request for Google, for search, uh, search engine, you don't need to assume that all the searches will happen in one machine, okay? Typically what happens, if it actually was implemented long ago, like for example, if you create a search which consists of three different words, then every word will be, every word will be searched on a separate server. Okay? In that case, the search is done effectively. Okay? So this phrase is not search on one server which is hitting the same one major database, okay? one database. So this actually search is split into integral parts of the individual words, and these individual words is actually placed on the different servers and searched that way. After that, results are combined, and then a uh, probability of uh, appropriate answer is calculated, and then you get the most uh, meaningful answers. Okay? So it means that uh, computational power of the server might also be separated under different CPUs. Okay. So, uh, so that. Uh, as soon as we start to talk about servers, we have to talk about the two tiers of architecture. Okay, and then they are talking about three tiers and n tiers of architecture. And uh, uh, if you go on the interview, they may ask that question. Okay. But uh, to be on the better side, what I ask, uh, I would advise you to do is that if uh, you're talking with a manager or developer or chief of development, whatever, like that, ask that question first. Okay? Ask how many tiers you have in your architecture. Okay? So uh, people are uh, pleased to hear that question, really. Okay? So that's without any exceptions. Okay? And you will realize that half of your interview time, 
will be spent when other people will describe the architecture to you rather than being the other way around. <laughs> it works, it always works, okay, no exceptions. Because people are happy to describe what they are doing and then when you, when you ask that meaningful question, then they will be more than happy to describe what they are doing. Okay? So uh, how many tiers they have? And then they started to go with databases, servers, processors, and then intermediate layers, and that will take more time. And then if you are a good listener, they actually may have a good impression that you are a very knowledgeable person, and which will result in the offer. <laughs> that also works. This is actually a small thing, a small thing but it works. Okay? And uh, it's fair. Okay? You ask them a very valid question, and uh, you expect to hear, hear uh, you know, a good answer. But don't ask it in a situation when they have Windows-based applications. <laughs> in that part, <laughs> that will be actually a bummer. <laughs> be, be, be very careful. Okay? First, make uh, some research and realize what they're working on before asking that. But typically, yeah, the people are very, very happy to tell more about the application, how it works. And this is actually a good backdoor open for you, okay, just to confess that. So, uh, but still question remains, what a 2D architecture, what a 2D architecture is. So typically, uh, when uh, talking about the 2D architecture, this is a typical example. This might be not internet, might be actually you know, cable attached to the computer. When they start to develop applications, many new startups starting from this architecture. They have some machine or a couple of machines here, workstations. They connect it to the server. And then what they needed to do, they needed to create a prototype of the software and in order to demonstrate to the potential investors. Okay? They say, okay, here's the, our the idea, how it should work, and here how we implemented this architecture here, uh, this way. So, uh, but let's discuss why, why is it two-tier and not multi-tier and what's the drawback of this architecture. Okay, because that's a, <coughs> a, a, some companies still do that. So it's good to, uh, good to know why it's, it's that to the architecture. So uh, what happens is that uh, they create a server and this server hardware will handle everything. Okay? So what happens is because they put a web server over there which will handle your web request and also they put a database over there. So your data will be stored on that server. So you may justify it saying, you know what, web server will talk to the database in no time because they are located on the same server with the same CPU. <coughs> and then actually will not waste some time on a network latency. And we'll get the information as soon as possible from the database and we'll present to the client. Okay? And later on, we'll become a big company <laughs> you know, some, some years ahead. Then in that case, we'll change that. So uh, changing it uh, to other to, to model here will be very painful. Okay, so typically it means that we have to refactor completely uh, completely the application. So uh, it means that you don't have to uh, base your prototype on two here. It's a very bad idea, but nevertheless we have to investigate that and see why it's a bad. So um, uh, because this is not scalable, it means that. Uh, 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 you, see, you overload your CPU because CPU will be busy handling web request. CPU will be busy uh, handling disk space because you have to write write and write and read something from disk space. And CPU also will be busy with the handling database request because typically uh, very few applications don't require database. Typically, this is the case. You have to have the database attached to the web server. Now, uh, here's the uh, schematically. This is a sequential diagram of the two-tier of, of the architecture. So what happens is that you start the application and you connect it using your privileged user, uh, and then also a lower privileged user accessing the very first page. Because first page, when the login page, should be accessible to you, doesn't matter what, okay? If it's, not, if it's secure, then no one virtually can log in because you cannot authenticate yourself, right? So the very first page, authentication page, is typically uh, not secure and it's available to anonymous user. So what you do here after that, you provide your, and it sends back the, uh, the, the login page, and then you uh, provide your credentials, like username and password, and send to the server, and then the uh, server assigns a session ID to your user, and then create a security token, which you can use. If you don't utilize the server within a given period of time, then uh, that token is expired, so basically you lose your connection. Uh, you have to authenticate yourself. Okay, and then all subsequent requests pulled back from the server, you use that security token 
uh, until you terminate the session or several terminate the session. Okay. But typically all activity which uh, happens between you and a server happens on the server side. So it means that server has authentication mechanism, server has a file system, server has a databases and everything. So that was, uh, 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 that's what is described here. And this is a client here and this is a database but it should be server. Okay, anyway. So that's a two-tier architecture, and uh, you should be able to be, uh, you, you should memorize it you know, mm -hmm. as much as you can, and then be able to produce it on a, if you need to pass, okay, that's a two-tier architecture, okay? But again, be preventive, okay, and ask that question yourself, okay? And here see that, okay? Before waiting until they ask this question to you, okay? So, um, uh, 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 3 architecture is definitely much better than 2 tier architecture. And this is a deviation from 2 tier. And uh, what happens here is that we introduce an agent between the client and between the, between the server. So the role of the agent might be manifold and make, you can do a lot of uh, activities. And this agent might be responsible for never nice graphical interface. That interface may be uh, responsible for data validation, whatever data you send to the server and also maybe, uh, maybe queuing, responsible queuing and so on. Basically, you can, uh, depending on application, it may fulfill different roles here. So, um, uh, translation services, data retrieval services, uh, queuing, uh, multiple, basically, the roles might be multiple here. Uh, and here's an example of 3 tier architecture. So what happens here is that we have uh, a database tier here, which might be handled by one or more machines, database machines, but typically they will be located on a separate hardware. The reason for that is that requirements for a machine, I mean the database requirements for the hardware is different uh, from the web server. Okay? So databases typically require a lot of RAM, okay? and that RAM should be uh, available all the time. And CPU is actually also they put heavy load on the CPU. Whereas web services actually uh, is contrary. They don't require a lot of RAM, but they require CPU. So in this particular case, we have user interface, which uh, is responsible for presenting the uh, output to the user or input and output to the user of a nice for format. So essentially what happens here is that Imagine that you, uh, business, this business logic, which is also might be very complex, and uh, this might be located on one machine, might be located on a server machine. So nothing to do directly with this the connection to the hardware. But uh, for example, if you're accessing uh, data, this, uh, this um, server and requesting uh, historical data for, for example, weather forecast or earthquake history, whatever, okay? So uh, this business uh, logic may produce the answers to you. But the answers may come in a form of, for example, um, date, let's say, for example, 1996, this is 1st of January, and then it produces some coordinates here as an error. Okay? Data is valid. Okay, next earthquake may be happened in 1997, say, the 1st of July, and also this coordinate and the magnitude, and so on, so on, so on. So this data is valid. And uh, some people who are used to console applications will be happy to receive this information in this format. Okay? But most of the users, they are not happy in this format. They like this information will be presented very nicely. Like, for example, uh, in the form of uh, icons. And, uh, the, uh, the, bigger, uh, the bigger the magnitude, the bigger the circles, and the deeper the color, and so on. Which is actually, uh, can be implemented with business logic, but somehow you will violate the uh, uh, integrity of this business life uh, because this part is responsible exclusively for requesting the data from database uh, validate this data for example because you may actually put very complex logic may say you know what I'm interested in earthquakes in the Pacific region but with, uh, which uh, magnitude uh, not less than five and which happened in the morning hour so whatever okay or maybe related to the moon position okay let's assume someone is doing some percent so basically you're requesting complex data here and this business logic is responsible for doing that, validating all the logic, and producing the array of results in this following format. 
if you overload this business logic to the presentation layer, you actually violated the logic. Because in the next time uh, they need to make some changes to this business logic, they have to make sure that uh, business logic is, in, is, is good, okay, they didn't violate that, but also they have to make sure that formatting is correct as well. So basically, you put two items in one, one page, which is not good. On the other hand, if you keep this business logic separate, I'm saying, you know, this business logic is exclusively busy with retrieving appropriate data, okay? And I'm responsible for that. Typically, this is done by separate group in the company, okay? And this group in the company is responsible exclusively for valid data. Okay. As soon as it uh, requests the data and the uh, corresponding answer is uh, retrieved, then this group is put to this role. And they're also responsible for uh, making improvements. Okay. Another group which might be sitting and developing UI applications on the UI interface has nothing to do with this, with this uh, data logic. They don't care about how this business logic is working and they don't even participate in the meetings. Probably, uh, I was probably managing UI. Okay, but typically not developers. So what they're busy with, they are creating the user interface in the sense that every time you send the data to the interface, this interface actually loads these images and the color these images and then put these images in a, a earth map, okay, somewhere. And uh, you see that they have completely different goals. Okay, they, are, they are dependent on each other, but they have completely different goals. This group is not dependent on how the data will be presented, and this group is not uh, dependent on uh, how this data is searched. Okay? As soon as they, I mean, as much as they care is that when data comes to them, then the nice interface is shown. So if you are working uh, in this group, in a user interface group as a QA engineer, then what you can do, you can actually mimic this business logic, right? They call it also uh, mocking. Okay? So essentially you're creating bogus uh, business layer. What you need to do, you need a small application which will produce data in this format. Okay, you can do it manually, you can write a small little script which will generate that. But as soon as you uh, provide the input to this user interface, you can test that the user interface is working correctly. Okay, and then on the other hand, if you talk to the people <coughs> from this group, they say, you know what, I don't care what you do over there. I'm, okay? I'm, I'm busy with my data, okay? don't, don't interfere with me. I don't care if, the, for example, the image is shifted here, that's your problem, okay? So this actually, these uh, logics are separated to get, uh, from each other, and that's actually typically separated physically as well. But uh, they are dependent on each other because eventually they are showing the data. But in this case, you have three-tier architecture here, okay? You have database, which will be prob probably different group, and you have uh, the business logic here, which will be responsible for working out the data, and we have another interface, which is here. This might be also very complex because this might collect data from different databases as well. In this particular case, it's linked only to this basic this logic, but it might be okay, for example, if you are searching the uh, uh, air tickets, okay, just a problem ticket, you may actually search at the same time making search in several languages. Uh, the, only, uh, the only condition is that the input data, they should coordinate with each other. So basically, the input data should come in a specific format. Okay, otherwise, so you have to spend a lot of time creating an interface the way that the data comes in a different format, you should be able to format it. Okay, so, but again, this will be so responsible for this user interface uh, uh, that layer. So, and then you can put another layer here just for doing something else, okay, upon your needs. Okay, you can do that. For example, uh, you may put another layer here, for example, by talking about uh, geological survey, which was will be responsible for monitoring the sensor throughout the globe, okay? And constantly putting the data into the database, okay? And you see that that group, let's say question mark here, question mark here. So that group will have nothing to do with this data access layer because uh, they, are, uh, they are not busy with the working up this data, historical data. They are essentially busy for working up the data they receive currently on a real time uh, frame and they are responsible for putting this data in the correct format into the database. That's what they are responsible for. They are not uh, interested uh, in uh, showing this data, current information, I mean how this data will be shown. That's not a business. And they are not uh, interested how this data will be interpreted, okay? As much as they care that the data is correct, this correct data is put into the database, okay? 
So depending on the application, we might have several layers. But typical are talking about think that's what typical is. Okay. Exactly. Very interesting question was asked. So we talk about thin clients. And the question was thin clients architecture is two tier or three tier? What do you think? Uh, we covered a thin client architecture, right? Basically, if you go back to, let's go to this slide. So, this one, okay. So, when we're covering these thin clients, okay, we didn't know about two tier and three tier. Now we learn about two and three tier architecture. Now, how do we classify this uh, thin client uh, implementation as a two tier or three tier? Two. Two. Actually, it's irrelevant. <laughs> that question is irrelevant to think client. Okay? Because uh, remember, think client is essentially a messenger. Okay? Whatever you, it's an input device. Whatever happens, how you define is a three tier or four tier or five tier architecture, it depends on the server. Okay? Because this part, the uh, interface, user interface, so, uh, uh, graphical interface, and the uh, thin client will always be there. Your server here may implement 10 tier architecture. And in that case, you're going to have 10 tier. Okay? But, uh, thank you. It's irrelevant of the thin client. Okay? So, the reason is that when we're talking about the tiers, we're not talking, we're talking about the hardware, or how basically the piece of hardware saying, you know, this is the tier you can physically separate. Okay? When we're talking about the tiers, let's go move forward, fast forward, as, as soon as fast as I can. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, software layers, most probably. Because when we are talking about the server, the server, uh, the concept of the server is interchangeable. When we are talking about the server, we can say server, this is a piece of hardware, which is actually consuming an electricity, which is requiring maintenance, which has disk space, and which has uh, memory, and so on. But on the other hand, uh, the server is also a software, because if you're not installing and configuring web server, you are not able to connect to that machine, right? So depending on the context, you should be realized what we are talking about. And if we are talking about the tiers, then we are talking about the software, from software point of view, not from the hardware. Okay? So um, when we started with the tiers, uh, these tiers, okay? When we're talking about the two, two, two tiers, in this case you can say yes, we are talking about two tiers architecture, in this case everything is sitting on one piece of hardware. But if you are having, say, multi-tiers, these multi-tiers might be sitting on the, oh, sorry, might be sitting on this hardware as well, depending on how you construct your architecture. Typically, you separate these tiers, okay? You have, for example, database server here, application server, you have file server, and you have web server. Okay? But no one prevents you to combine them all in, in, in one machine. In hardware, in this case, you are going to have two, uh, two tier typically. But uh, uh, the tiers are actually separated by uh, by the role they do in these uh, uh, in these actions. Okay? For example, this tier is specifically designed for working out the data. Okay? Now, this might be a piece of software sitting on a separate machine. Or we might be sitting in a cloud, or may consist of several machines because you may have say several blocks here, and each block will be might be a separate piece of software. Might be you, you can start this way, or it might be one application, basically different parts of these different components of the same application, depending. Okay, depends. Okay, so the the, the distinction here, how they are designed, is basically from the operational point of view and how they are working by design. Okay, not necessarily they are physically separated or located on different machines or located on different parts of, I mean, uh, of the application. It might be located on the same application, you install one application, and everything is there. Okay. So these tiers typically, yeah, if you are talking about your application, yeah, this tier is a separate uh, machine because they have different requirements for the hardware. Okay. But uh, it's not defined by the how many pieces of hardware you have. So for example, if I have five machines, I have five tier application. It's wrong. Okay, so you have to look at the roles each individual part of this whole process is playing. Okay. So that's how they design. 
typically have more machines than peers. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. Okay, any other questions? Okay, okay. So let's talk about firewalls because these uh, firewalls are also very popular. So that, uh, you might be involved in testing these firewalls as well. So what a firewall is, is not a, a brick uh, wall with a mod of cocktail uh, smash into it. It's basically a shield that uh, protects uh, private information from, uh, from all things coming from the internet. Okay? So firewall prevents unauthorized access user to gain access to the company's proprietary information and also uh, sometimes blocks the user within the company to reach undesirable resources. Okay, so it actually may work both ways. And uh, firewall uh, in the companies typically consists of the software and the hardware. Okay, software, if you are using Windows operation system, they are configurable so firewall, and then the IT requires that all your firewalls are turned on on your machines. And sometimes even this possibility to turn it off is disabled. Okay, so user, typical users in the company don't have that possibility to turn it off. In, in many companies I work in, that possible was turned off. Okay, only IT engineer with administrative purpose can actually manipulate that. This is to happen because you know uh, prevent users from accidentally switching off, and then uh, basically creating a security, a possible security breach. Okay, but besides that, we also have. Uh, hardware firewalls. Basically, it's a piece of hardware which uh, is exactly designed for that purpose. Okay, just to prevent unauthorized access to the company. And uh, this firewall starts from three hundred dollars and up. Okay, depending on the load they can carry, and uh, depending on the people. And they are also configurable and programmable. Okay, so uh, and the, may, the architecture may be very complex. I'm not going to cover that. Probably you had a class. You had a class of network uh, networks. We had two, uh, two classes of network. We probably discussed that. We discussed that. So there's no need to go and uh, discuss the details. But essentially, the firewalls uh, have main goal just to protect uh, the company from unauthorized access. Uh, also, uh, there are companies who are specializing on these firewalls. Okay, so it means that you can delegate these activities to some other company. Essentially, <coughs> they will take care of all traffic coming to your company to and out. Okay, so you pay them some, uh, uh, some some money for that, but on the other hand, they take all your headaches. Okay, so if you are engineers are not busy, and you can be going back to the Okay, uh, there are companies who are specializing uh, exclusively on email filtration. Okay, so we filtering all this traffic. Because companies now. If you don't filter that, the amount of email traffic is huge. Okay, and one of the company is Postini. If you try to the SFO, you will see that company on the right hand side. Okay. Postini is kind of Italian name. That company is specializing on email filtering, but there are many, many other companies who are specializing on that. Okay. So uh, what happens also that uh, you know, schematically, it looks like a, a company diagram may look like this. So they have a firewall installed here, and then uh, you have private work in a, a private network in a company, which is typically accessed by many users in the company. Definitely, there might be some areas which are restricted to the managers, directors, and so on. But typically, only internet resources are available to you, and this is a private network. They may create sub masks and then uh, local IP addresses. And then uh, companies would not allow you to directly connect to the internet because that would be a big security breach possible. Because more connections you have to the internet, more uh, doors you open. Okay? So essentially, all internet uh, connections are seamlessly, because you don't see that excluding, uh, explicitly, are uh, navigated to one machine or several machines in a pool. And then uh, these machines will handle the uh, traffic. So it means that. They have some server in the proxy server, so uh, <coughs> these servers will actually uh, take requests from you, redirect this uh, request to the browser, to the servers on the internet, and get responses back. Definitely, you can. Uh, this uh, configuration of this machine might be very complex. For example, you can specify the sites which users are not uh, uh, allowed to visit. Okay. They may also be configured that certain ports will be unavailable, like people who, who could not use, would like to use, but could not use messengers. 
okay, for example, Yahoo Messenger, the Google Messenger, they will not, will not be used, but because these ports will be blocked. Okay? I work in a company which exclusively blocks this messenger port. It's a stupid idea because a lot of people communicating even within the company using messengers. Okay? They consider it is much faster and better than emails in many cases. Plus, you keep in touch with your friends, which is not a bad idea. But you know, some companies buy, uh, don't allow that. So essentially, this uh, happens to this firewall, and then this perimeter of the company network is protected. So it means that you are not allowed to make direct calls uh, to outside of the company. Uh, any questions? Okay. So typically, that's uh, on IT engineer's side. Okay. So we have two types of firewalls, which is pocket filtering routers and the four base uh, firewalls. So uh, packet filtering is uh, uh, firewalls which are designed on the screening incoming packages, incoming information to the company. And then uh, it basically provides basic network security based on IPs, okay, or based on some uh, recent information. For example, uh, recently in the company I work in, recently we were cut from internet because a uh, server which our mail server was hosted on, it's outside of the company. That server also hosted some spammers, okay? And these people were trying to send a lot of emails from that particular server, and that server was blacklisted, okay? It's considered by internet community as not secure and not good, so we decided to cut off the traffic completely to that server, okay? And then it took a while until the connection was restored. So it means that uh, we are, they actually put this information about the potentially dangerous server, which was actually origin of the spam, and then connection to the back that server was severe. Okay. So, and uh, that's what uh, uh, this uh, uh, packet filtering firewalls may work operate on. For example, you can instruct them that all incoming traffic from these particular IP addresses will be blocked. Okay. So it means that you will not be receiving anything from this given particular IP addresses. Particular, uh, for example, if, for example, there are spam going on, like for example. Uh, Santa Claus, greeting from Santa Claus, that right? is a bogus email. Then I can block this email from there. Okay? As soon as this email uh, is a public is aware of that, that this is a spam, they can actually, you know, this information can be inserted there, and this allows me to block this incoming emails from attachment. Or uh, attachment as well. So, for example, if it contains some attachment, especially encrypted attachment, then they block that as well. Okay, some servers block that. For example, if you uh, so if you attach encrypted file in the uh, other attachment, then it might be blocked. Okay. Uh, router is also uh, uh, yeah communication protocols. Uh, you can actually have, have it configured that based on the protocol communication protocols, based on IP addresses. For example, we, we covered all of the messengers. But we can also streaming might be prohibited and so on. Okay. So it's a highly configurable one. Proxy based is uh, software running on host computers that uh, uh, network perimeter. Basically, if you go to this uh, 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 diagram here, these are actually proxy bars because what happens is that these machines, which are exposed to the outside world, okay, and all traffic goes to them, okay, and then you can also configure these machines. So saying, you know what, you are you allowed only to allow these particular uh, conditions to be, met, to be met. I mean, if the if particular conditions are met, then only this traffic is allowed. And you can do that as well. It's how In this case, you can specify ports, you can specify users, uh, what, what type? Uh, various conditions. Uh, 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 typically, these servers are called also the DMZ servers, or the device servers. <laughs> this is actually an image of the most highly, uh, highly protected and most um, widely known device zone, which is in uh, between South and North Korea. And uh, this is actually this term, DMZ, the device zone, taken into the computer industry. Mm -hmm. So this is actually these computers also can be called as DMZ, okay, the okay, device computer, because. They they keep the network secure okay, from the from the rest. Basically, no no internet activity is allowed. The only specific ones you know, through this uh, server, DMC servers. So um, 
Uh, DMZ, uh, that's, that's the role of DMZ servers. So they prevent uh, outside users of gaining direct access to any server on a uh, network. And also, uh, it also prevents some users from like a company to access un undesirable network resources, okay? which might possess some dangerous, uh, danger to the company. So even if one small uh, virus is reaching the computer uh, company network, then you know it takes a huge amount of time to clean that up. Okay? Just imagine, I think engineer will send an email saying don't open that. Okay? It takes company uh, personnel to read that email. And if someone opened that email, then they have to go and manually remove them so that they are actually uh, disconnected from the network. Clean that, it's a huge amount of resources and company actually spend a lot of time on that, uh, uh, of course, mine. Now, uh, said that, uh, next, next uh, topic, uh, pretty much we're not going to cover security, the testing security, but we, we have that topic, testing security testing, but not to the greatest detail because of the specifics of that subject. Uh, it's, it's a huge subject alone, and we're not going to prepare security engineers here. Okay? But we have to have clear understanding of it. Or some companies will require that. So, uh, distributed processing is also a very interesting uh, subject. We should be able uh, to be aware of that. And the testing of this distributed processing. I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, when you said that as QA uh, testing entails, you sometimes have you may have to test the firewall. So, is it. Uh, it depends. For example, if you go in a startup and uh, that startup is doing business, some business like, for example, uh, Instagram or photos or whatever, mm -hmm. that's not your goal. Okay, that's not your role. That will be delegated, these activities will be delegated to the uh, IT engineer. Mm -hmm. He will be responsible for that or his manager. But if you are working in a company who is developing uh, routers or developing, for example, DMZ computers or firewalls, okay? In that case, that will be your primary goal, right? To test that, right? In that case, you have a test lab with some router over there. In that case, you have to create the test cases which will, uh, where you are going to test if the user can access network doing some tricks, okay? So you have to test that. Valid test case. It depends on the goal uh, again, goal of the company. If company is developing the uh, firewalls, then guess what? If you're hired by that company, then you have to test it. Right? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Typically not, because that's new and not your activity, but you should understand that. The reason which I brought this DMZ because uh, I work in a couple of companies and what happened is that uh, they have DMZ servers within the company. So what happened is that they had a database server which uh, was accessed uh, freely by everyone. Okay, that was production server. And it means that if developer came up with some idea saying, you know what, I don't think this uh, SQL query runs correctly, he was able to go directly change that SQL query. And you, you may realize that it's a very dangerous task, right? Depending on the knowledge, depending on the uh, actually uh, type or whatever, that introduces a huge security risk. After that, I say, you know what? It's not a lot. Okay, so if you'd like to change something on a production server, first you have to put in a test server, see if it is working okay. And only after that, you will be able to put in a production server. But they didn't cut access from the production server. So you still can access the production server. Simply, you were not allowed, uh, I mean, by the manager's order. Okay, that was okay, but. What happens is that quite often, from troubleshooting purposes and testing purposes, you needed to access the uh, production server. Because, for example, if something happens to production, it's not uh, converted to the test machine yet, or test database yet. You should be able at least to go and query that. Okay? So it means that everyone still had an access, at least read, read access to the production database. So it turned out that uh, in some scenarios, we put additional load on the production server, which affected the business, okay? So they said, this is not good, okay? So what they did instead, uh, I mean, uh, how they solved this problem, they actually collected information who needed direct access to the production server in a read-only mode, okay, not modification. Modification only was granted to the financial, because they, they should be able to change stuff, uh, data on, on a real-time time. But what they did actually, they created DMC server, 
which was connected to the production database server. Okay? So all the requests went through this DMZ server. Okay? And the primary goal from the DMZ server was to limit the access, at least that uh, it did not allow multiple access, multiple user access, it actually killing that. And also it prevented from running long SQL statements. For example, if the statement was running more than a couple of minutes, it was automatically shut down, basically terminated. <coughs> so and also it was responsible for authenticating uh, the uh, users. Besides, besides general, it, it was actually used to that. So uh, using the implementing these measures will allow to keep production server kind of isolated. So giving access to the users. Okay, because for some reason we, we definitely needed that. So in that case, we implemented that DMZ server, which was not <coughs> sitting on a perimeter of the company. It was sitting within the company, and then we're using that. Now, uh, the DMZ server was created by the company. It means that the software which was running that DMZ server was created by the company. We didn't buy it from other side. So it means that every time uh, something happened with this server, I mean the uh, <coughs> software vibes, okay, we have to update that. So you have to push update to the DMZ server as well. So it means that we had to test the DMZ server as well. Okay, it's pretty complicated, right? Mm -hmm. So QA was highly involved in these whole processes mm -hmm. for testing the production, semi-production, and test DMZ servers, and uh, putting some patches into that, and verifying that it's working. Okay, so in that case, you may find yourself in the conference when you need to test that. Nothing to do with outside traffic from outside the company. It was exclusively within the company, but nevertheless, we had the MCS server. Okay. And also, uh, the MCS server was used by many other departments, so <coughs> sometimes it was not responsive, okay? because it was limiting that, but nevertheless, sometimes it was not responsive. In that case, uh, QA also was keeping one server in reserve, actually, to get a development. And so in the case of such thing happens, then the second server is automatically thrown out. So you have you know, two or three servers available at any given moment of time. Okay. So, but you, I, I remember, you know, a friend of mine was completely busy with that, okay, keeping that DMZ server, configuring that, making sure that the database is operational, that, because the DMZ server had a small database on itself. Mm -hmm. okay. So it, it's a pretty complicated one. It's actually on time. <coughs> you know, IP was not involved with that at all. Mm -hmm. okay. So only developers and QA. So if you find yourself in such company, you cannot say. I don't know, it's not much. You have to do that. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so distributed processing uh, also very popular because uh, it allows you to complete some very complex tasks on the several machines. If your, uh, if your computation allows that, okay? Testing this, these scenarios is complex. It's very difficult. But uh, sometimes you need to do that. Okay, so the whole uh, idea, base idea behind these distributing processes is that if your task is allowed, to, I mean, it allows you to you know, split this task into small pieces, small portions, then you can have several computers or several CPUs working on this task in parallel. Okay, so whenever it's possible. For example, let's assume you are testing security. Okay. And then you say, okay, uh, this is the uh, how, uh, how I'm going to test the perfectly uh, encrypted. Okay, encryption is adequate. So what you did, you need to create all possible keys, right? And then try this all possible keys. So in this particular case, you can run all these possible keys on one machine, which may take years, or you can actually split this task. Uh, say one set of keys delegated to one machine, another set to another, and then you can run this task on several machines because individual set of keys are not dependent on each other. Okay, so the result of one set of keys completely relevant to another. Okay, they are completely completely separate. In that case, this task allows you to do that. Okay, another good example of uh, such task is uh, uh, is. Uh, I think it's NASA's project, I'm not sure about that. Uh, when they took a lot of <coughs> images of the space images, but they didn't have compute enough computing power to work out these images to make basically to increase the focus and increase the contrast. So what they asked, they asked uh, uh, community, uh, uh, people, enthusiasts all the world, to help with that task. 
So what engineers did, they created an application which allows us to which allows to enhance images. Okay. So and then what we need to do, we just need to download this application and install on your machine. Now, when you install this application, this application will automatically connect to the NAS server, download some image, uh, one of the many, many millions of images, and automatically work up this image and send that image back. And this process happens when your computer is idle. Okay? So when you are working on your computer, this application is not working. As soon as you go to bed and leave your computer on, then this application starts working. <coughs> so basically some computational power. And using this technique, they were able to uh, work out a lot of images, which otherwise impossible to do because they didn't have computational power, even with some supercomputers, and also make some discoveries, which is not bad. Okay? And such projects actually exist. So you can actually go and look for some project if you want to take participate in that. Some projects actually have some prizes, okay? A couple of thousands of dollars you can win if you're lucky. So, uh, but these are actually specific cases when uh, task allows us to be uh, the, the, the task is possible to be split into several pieces. Okay, if it's not possible, if the result of computation is dependent on a previous result, then you are out of luck because essentially you have to wait until the previous pieces is completed before you can continue. Okay. So uh, this is uh, essential of the distributed processing. Uh, next thing which you can uh, do is uh, interesting internet. So uh, you might be involved in this. So internet is actually becoming more and more complex. And then uh, it started simply with uh, uh, replicating what we had in outside the world, like internet. We are going to have the same interesting infrastructure locally in a company, publishing documents within the company. Now, with the time, it becomes more complex in the sense that there are special applications created for specifically for that purposes. One of the application is SharePoint probably heard about it, mm -hmm. okay, SharePoint. So what SharePoint is, it allows us to create a portal, company portal, and then uh, keep under one roof different uh, different pieces of information. For example, department web pages, like wiki pages, like images, discussion board, whatever, everything combined under one roof, okay? So as a engineer, you might be you might be asked to, be, to, to test this application to see accessibility levels, to see if the information is always available, and wiki pages are available, editable, and so on. Uh, Cajun is always, uh, uh, I mean, if they publish the, uh, for example, instructions, some instructions, you will be asked, you might be asked to test these instructions. For example, like uh, if you're installing, if you have instructions how to run the application, installing Java and running the application, they maybe ask you, you know, say, you know, our goal is that every new engineer who starts in the company, should not spend more than two hours doing that. Okay, so they will ask you to get a free, I mean, an empty machine, just fresh machine, and execute these instructions, and then make sure that it takes a more, no more than two hours. Okay, you might be involved in that. So the scenarios might be numerous, but this one, this is one of the possible ones. Okay. Uh, now let's go uh, into the theory of what client server of, uh, architecture is. That the basic architecture of is uh, uh, we have a client uh, which interacts at the front end portion of, uh, of the application and the back uh, uh, portion which interacts with the resources located in the company. And then <coughs> the client process contains uh, solution specific logic and then uh, contains the user interface and the server's interface between the back end and the user. Okay. So, uh, uh, backend may be connected with babies most probably, and the user may have more printers, modems, and higher powerful processors. So, uh, uh, the front end task and back end task, they have fundamentally different requirements towards the hardware. That also we have to keep in mind. You don't need to have very powerful machine, regardless of what they tell you at the Best Buy stores, in order to access the internet. Okay, definitely they like to sell even more high-end machines, but in order to check your email, you don't need powerful machines. I have XP at home, and I'm pretty happy with that, okay? Because what I do, I have time at home, I just check my email, just browse the internet, I'm more than now happy with that, I don't play games. So, uh, on the other hand, backend uh, requirements for the backend machines are different. different. Backend machine should be very powerful, CPU should be very powerful, 
and should have a lot of RAM, okay, and a lot of disk space. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Because uh, many users can utilize these resources. You are not alone who are actually asking information from the server. And server should be able to should be capable to serve all these requests in a timely manner. We are going to discuss these times and we are going to test these times, but you realize that uh, since we are talking about client server, you are not the only sole client to that given server. Uh, environment is typically also heter uh, heterogeneous in the back end. For example, if you have a front end uh, computer, it's most probably most users and consumers are using the Windows machines or Macintoshes. Okay, some 10 or 15 percent of the uh, personal computers are Macintoshes, but typically this is Windows machines. And on, on the back end, you may have combination of different uh, different CPUs from different vendors utilizing different operation system as well. Okay. So you have uh, you have variety there too. So uh, scalability. This is also very uh, key uh, key issue here when we are talking about the client server and when we are talking about web uh, applications because you typically don't face this problem when you have uh, when you're dealing with a personal computer. Okay. So remember we are talking about the personal. That's the key keyword here is a personal. So you are not sharing this computer with someone else, and you are not using this computer simultaneously with someone else. On the reality, in, in a uh, client server environment, you actually have a server which is serving many requests. Okay, we are, uh, these requests are coming from many users. And you should be able to satisfy these users and actually send requests, uh, 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 send the responses to all these users. At some amount of time, you uh, may need to improve or upgrade your hardware in order to meet the demand. Okay, and that is actually a critical issue here because uh, if you don't do that, you are going, it, it's going to, the load which users put on the server may affect performance. And this is actually very critical because a lot of uh, testing is done on a performance level. Okay, performance typically does not exist uh, on a personal computer level. Okay, so uh, if, for example, you are not happy with your machine, you're going to put in your, your CPU out in your machine, but more than uh, uh, machine performance, this actually has negligible impact on access to the internet. So the limiting factor is your connection to the internet, right? It's not your CPU, not your disk, uh, disk space, or not your disk or your browser. Typical limitation factor is internet connection. You like to have faster internet connection because you know that faster you get, the better you get the pages. But you don't upgrade, you know, to get fast internet, you don't upgrade your machine. You don't install, say, Windows 7 instead of Windows XP. Okay. So, and a very simple, as a very evil and negligible uh, uh, degradation of the performance may affect company business. Okay, so it's actually it's a huge science build on that. So we are going to cover that and we are going to test performance. That's where QA engineers will be involved in. And if you are in a testing web uh, applications, you are going to create a separate test on top of your performance. We are going to you know, cover that, talk about that as well. Okay. Now, on the back end, if in order to increase the performance, you have to add more machines typically and spread the load. That's what we call uh, scalability. Okay. Horizontal scalability. Or probably you have to develop, uh, uh, develop uh, better software, right? Increase the speed of the software, maybe change the uh, language, maybe change the architecture, technology, whatever, uh, in order to increase the performance. Because even slight uh, degradation performance may have huge impact. And typically, when they develop the software, they indicate that explicitly in the requirements, software requirements. Okay, what the software, uh, what is uh, what is expected from software? So they say that this web page should load within, say. Uh, five seconds, for example, okay? Or if your web application gives the possibility to upload the hard, uh, upload the files, you have to specify that. For example, a file of five megabytes in size should be uploaded in four seconds. And you may list this, I mean, uh, you may um, read the requirements and say, what a big deal, okay? Five seconds or six seconds, what a big deal. But that's actually a very important matrix and if the software is not meeting this uh, meeting this uh, requirement, then uh, you cannot release it. And either you have to 
change the requirements, and we want to agree with that, or uh, you have to require from the developers to meet that uh, value, okay, so that uh, performance. Otherwise, you cannot release that. Okay, that's that's very very serious. Don't don't, don't think that it's uh, plus minus and a couple of seconds doesn't play out. It's very important. <coughs> plus, in addition to that, when you, you check the performance with every build, you actually can uh, check the uh, signature of the build. Okay, uh, you can compare this performance data and then you can make a decision which build is better. For example, if the build is uh, performing uh, uh, activity slower, then you say we have degradation in performance. And that's typically a serious issue, and developers take it very seriously. Okay, and management too. I've been in the companies, in all companies where I actually touch this performance, every time performance goes down or went down, it actually be the red flag. They actually paid very big attention to that. If this is regardless of uh, uh, Windows or web application, but for web it's actually very important. It's extremely important for the web. Okay. So we don't have that in, uh, typically we don't have that in Windows. Okay. 